Okay, so we've picked up the terms endothermic and exothermic, and we want to see what those mean when we're talking about chemical reactions. Here's a reaction, and this chemical is called either ethyne or acetylene, and they use it in welding torches and cutting torches. It burns very hot. And this is the reaction where it burns. It reacts with oxygen in the air, and it produces carbon dioxide, steam, and a large amount of heat. So is that reaction endothermic or exothermic? It's exothermic because energy is produced by the reaction. If you, use, if you look at these words, endo sounds a little bit like into. An endothermic reaction is one you have to put energy into to make it happen. Uh, cooking eggs is endothermic. You need eggs and you need heat, and if you have both of those things, you can produce cooked eggs. So an endothermic reaction is one where you have, like, energy plus eggs produces and I shouldn't have said omelet because you can't it's not an omelet if it's plain eggs so I'm gonna get jumped on for that but anyway the point is you must put in energy to make that reaction go an exothermic reaction exo sounds like exit as in energy exits the reaction as it goes Burning gasoline or burning acetylene is an example of an exothermic reaction where as the reaction goes, it produces energy and throws it out into the surroundings. Things around this will get hot. Oh, and I just, uh, I just gave away part B. What effect would this have on the temperature of the surroundings? The surroundings, something in the surroundings will heat up. The surroundings will absorb the energy that's being thrown off by this reaction. In this case, you get a flame when you burn acetylene, and that flame can heat up can make steel so hot that it melts something in the surroundings is going to absorb that heat what does that tell us about the chemicals well it means that acetylene and oxygen must have a lot of energy in them if you have a tank of acetylene you treat that with respect because it has the potential to ignite or explode if you don't handle it carefully there is a large amount of chemical potential energy in the acetylene and in the oxygen that it could combine with. After it's burned, no one is scared of the steam and carbon dioxide because they've dumped all their energy, they're depleted now. These chemicals have low energy. So an exothermic reaction is one where the reactants start out high and then they drop. To low energy afterwards. This drop of energy is how the reaction releases energy. It started out with a bunch stored in the chemicals. That energy is released out into the surroundings and afterwards you've got, it's not literally ashes, but the, the residue of the reaction has very little energy left. An endothermic reaction is the other way around where you start with low energy chemicals, pump energy into them, and they end up at high energy afterwards. So this is what endo looks like. And an exothermic reaction is one where you start high and then the chemicals start high and then drop. We'll get into more detail about these diagrams later. These are in a, uh, an upcoming lesson, but I thought it wouldn't hurt to see that a little bit early. It's a good concept. Okay, just a few definitions. Thermal energy is a measure of how fast the particles in a material are vibrating. It's kinetic energy of molecules or atoms. Unless you're at absolute zero, freezing cold, the atoms in a material are jiggling back and forth all the time. Thermal energy is a measure of how rapidly they are doing that. If something is perfectly cold, it sits still. Very cold things only move a little bit, and hotter things move more and more. Very high energy particles jump around all over the place because they have very high amounts of kinetic energy, and they collide with each other very, very often and very hard. That's what it means for something to have a lot of thermal energy. Temperature is a measure of the average thermal energy. in a material. Because if you have a pot of water or anything, not all the particles are moving the same amount. You're going to have some particles that are sitting fairly still, 
other particles that are moving at kind of average speed, and a few that have picked up a lot of velocity and are zinging around like bullets. In, even in a glass of water just sitting on a counter, you have this situation where some particles are almost immobile, some are very quick, and many are in between. When we give the temperature of something, we're saying the average energy that those particles have, and when you heat something up, the average goes up. And finally, in a lot of cases, the term heat is used to mean the same thing as thermal energy. That's a cheat that you can get away with most of the time, but what you should know in this course is that we nor strictly speaking, we should use heat for thermal energy in transit. Technically, heat means that you have thermal energy in one object or one place, and it's moving to another place. So if you have a, let's say you have an iron bar and you put one end in a fire. This end heats up, its temperature rises, it gains thermal energy at this end, and then energy starts to be transmitted down the end of the bar, and if you hold on to this long enough, you're, it's going to start to burn your hand eventually, because thermal energy will conduct down the bar until eventually even the far end heats up. That transfer of energy is what we should call heat. Now having said that, people use heat and thermal energy interchangeably quite a bit. I definitely do it myself. You're going to hear me make that mistake a few times and I will try to catch it if I do it in a lesson. But be aware, there is technically a difference and the difference is thermal energy is just sitting someplace. Heat is thermal energy going from one place to another. Okay. Here they talk about what happens when a chemical reaction occurs, and there are two steps in pretty much every chemical reaction, and one of those steps is exothermic and one of those steps is endothermic. What I mean is, let me give you an example. I've got the beginning of a chemical reaction here, and this is a reaction where oxygen reacts with hydrogen And if you do that, when oxygen and hydrogen react, they explode, and what's left afterwards is a cloud of vapor, which turns out to be steam. This is how you make water. Oxygen and hydrogen will react with each other and produce water, you, and because it's odd, the reaction releases a lot of heat, the water forms as a cloud of steam that you could collect and end up and condense into a glass if you wanted to. So here's the reaction. I've got an oxygen molecule here, and you probably noticed that this isn't balanced yet, so let's sort that out because we're diligent chemists. Two oxygens here means double the water. Now we have four hydrogens, so double that. And so it looks like I drew the right number of particles here. We have an oxygen molecule. There it is. We have two hydrogen molecules, one there, one there. And they can recombine to make water. If you want to do this, two things have to happen. First, we have to dismantle these existing molecules. If we want to make water, we have to break up this oxygen into two separate pieces, so get. there's that. We have to tear apart these hydrogens, there's that one, and there's that one. That step is where you break all the original bonds. It's like you want to make something out of Lego, so you have to take apart the Lego things that you made before to free up new blocks so that you have something to build with. That step is always endothermic. There's always an endothermic step where you tear apart the old molecules. Now that you've done that, you can rearrange these pieces. You can say, okay, I want an oxygen here. I'm making water, so I want an oxygen with two hydrogens stuck onto it. There we go. And now I have to do that again. Here's another oxygen. Here's two hydrogens stuck on there. Now I have two water molecules. That step, where you put the pieces back together, is always exothermic. 
that's the one where new molecules form. So they're showing that up here as you break chemical bonds, energy is absorbed, in other words it's endothermic, and then energy is released when those new those atoms lock together to make new molecules. What changes is which of these steps is bigger. If it takes a tiny amount of energy to take apart the old molecules, and then a large amount of energy is released when the new ones form, then your reaction's exothermic. That's what they're showing here, is they're saying a little bit of energy is absorbed, and then you get a lot of energy back. Overall, that reaction will be exothermic. It's like, I had to spend two dollars to get this business started, and then I made millions off it. Overall, that business was profitable. For a chemical reaction, same idea. I put a little energy in, I got a lot of energy back. Overall, this reaction gave me energy. You can also have reactions that go the other way around. I sank a million dollars into this business and I made ten bucks. In that case, the business was a loss overall. In chemistry terms, that means I put in a lot of energy to break the old bonds. I only got a little bit of energy back, so overall this reaction cost me energy. So you always have these two steps, it's just a question of which one is larger, and that's what determines if a reaction overall is releasing energy, meaning exothermic, or taking energy, which is endothermic. Okay, they give us a list here of reactions and ask us what type they are. And uh, some of these are easy and others are a little tricky, we'll get into it. A piece of paper is ignited and burns with a bright flame. Is that taking in energy or giving energy out? This is exothermic because burning paper releases energy. The surroundings will get hot. If you're holding this paper, you'll burn your hand. It's clearly putting out energy into, into the surrounding area. Pentaborane reacts violently with oxygen to form boric oxide and water, typically bursting into flame and exploding. Fire and explosions are a pretty good indication that something is exothermic. It has so much energy that it's throwing it out into the surroundings. An explosion means that the products are heating and expanding so much that they're bursting out into the surrounding area. That means there must be surplus energy there. Iron metal is formed and carbon dioxide is released when iron oxide is heated to a very high temperature in the presence of solid carbon. The fact that this requires a lot of heat to get started is an indication that it's endothermic. Things that you have to cook or put in a fire to get the reaction to start probably means that they're endothermic. You need to be pumping a lot of energy into them to make them go. Here we take two chemicals, we mix them, and the temperature of the mixture goes up. If the mixture is heating up, the reaction must be releasing energy. So exothermic. If you mix two chemicals and the container gets warm, exothermic reaction. If the container gets cold, endothermic reaction, because the chemicals are sucking energy out of the water. Mixing ammonium thiocyanate and barium hydroxide octahydrate in a beaker causes water on the outside of the beaker to freeze. That's, okay, that's the example I was just giving. If the water is freezing and the beaker is getting cold, that would mean the reaction is sucking energy out of the surroundings. That's what we call an endothermic reaction. And finally, when ba baking soda does its thing and breaks into carbon dioxide, which makes bubbles in muffins and bread and makes them rise, that occurs at high temperature. Why does it happen at high temperature? Because it's endothermic, it needs that heat, for the reaction needs that heat to go. Now, this reaction does happen even at room temperature, but it happens much faster when the chemicals get hot. That's an indication that the reaction needs energy input, it's endothermic.